Dude, seriously, if these gears mesh at all, I'm gonna flip my wig. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Wow. We are so close to awesomeness. Today, we're gonna to continue the series by looking at some of the hardware that I purchased, especially the major components, like this guy right here. In fact, come here, boy, come here. Good boy, good job. Don't you love it when they're obedient? This right here is a nine horsepower ATC spindle. That stands for Auto Tool Changer. It's one of the major components that I wanted for my machine. And that, in fact, my search for this guy is actually how I ended up with this frame. In the last episode, I told you guys, I think the most cost-effective design is a sheet metal design. And that was what I started with on this project. In fact, I'll put the model on the screen here for you. Uh, one of you asked if uh, what thickness of material I was gonna use, and I was designing with 11 gauge, which is three millimeters thick or about an eighth of an inch. All right, so let's move on to the hardware. To me, by far, the best way to get the maximum amount of power is by buying used industrial equipment. There are two beautiful things about that. One of them is obvious, and that's the price. If I had bought this guy new, it would have been $7,500. That's a, at least today in 2019. That was the price I found online. I managed to get this guy for way cheaper than that, and we're gonna talk more about cost later. Uh, check online auctions, check Facebook Marketplace, check Craigslist, check every local option because they're gonna be local industrial auctions as well, and I can't possibly name them all, but they are there, I promise you. And if you're checking diligently, you'd be astonished at the value you can get. This dude took me about three and a half months to find, but when I found it, it was worth it because it also came with tools, which is another thing that's really common when buying used equipment. I have a couple of tests that I run to make sure that the motor will work before I purchase it because I've bought quite a few used industrial motors, and I talked about those motors in other episodes. The very first thing that I do is I basically spin the shaft and make sure that it will actually rotate freely. If you feel a lot of resistance or it rotates a tiny bit and stops, then that might be a warning sign. You might wanna actually plug that motor in and just make sure it runs, it's not noisy or anything like that. But if it spins freely, I don't worry about turning it on. The second thing that you need to check is continuity between the windings. Uh, the wires that are supposed to be connected together inside, just check each one, make sure there's continuity, but also make sure you don't have continuity between any of those wires and the body of the motor. If you do, that means that there's a short somewhere and that motor's no good, I wouldn't do it. If you can pass those two tests, then you've got like a 90% chance that the motor works and I don't even worry about plugging it in. From there, you can start your negotiations. So I purchased my spindle, but now I need to figure out how to operate the thing. This is the original manifold block. And as you can see, this is what it looked like before. I have since taken this apart and made another one, which you can see from a little bit closer over on this side. I've added this valve here, which will allow me to uh, shut off the air quickly right here while I'm working on it, because I don't actually know how this works yet. I'm trying to kind of figure it out, so just bear with my ignorance here. So I've made a new manifold block. I know from watching some YouTube videos how these valves work now, and I'm pretty sure what's supposed to happen is air normally comes from the manifold block through here, and then when I throw the switch, air is gonna be allowed to come back and out of this hole here. That's what I think is gonna happen. Both of these are wired together, so why you need two, I don't quite know yet because they should both be relieving air from this main line. Again, not entirely sure why there are two of them, but that's what we have. So now we've got two, oh, maybe one's redundant. That makes sense. So this should let air out here. If this one fails, it'll let air out here. I bet that's what it is. All right, so sorry, a little discovery just happened there. So here's what I plan to do. I'm gonna throw this valve open very slowly, so not really throwing it open. And I'm hoping that this dude is gonna eject or like suck it up tighter or do something to let me know how it works. And then I've got these valves wired to a switch. And my plan is to throw the switch, see what happens, but also I have it right here in my hand so I can turn it back off if something I don't expect is happening. 
That's enough. I need to turn this dude on. It's kind of noisy, but this is like my favorite part of this whole process. <laughs> Beautiful. Let's slowly get some air to the system. All right, nothing catastrophic yet. All right, that's in, there. that's in there pretty good. So the air is on and it's still holding the tool really tight. Okay, yeah, that's definitely in there. So let's see what happens when we throw the switch. Let me hold this just in case it jumps. Sweet! Okay. So I just felt a burst of air shoot up in my face from this. Oh, we got it out. Now we need to get it back in there. All right, so it's on and it's not holding it. Let me shut that off. We're gonna try that one more time, make sure it's what I think it is. So it looks like when you throw the valve on, that releases the tool. And then as it's going off, it creates a vacuum temporarily to suck it back in, is what I think is happening. So it's locked right now. If I throw it on, that releases the tool. And if I flip it off with it close enough, yes, I felt it pull it. Yes! Okay, we're in business. And now we know how it works. So here's the deal, that's a huge victory. You gotta understand, when I started this project, I had no idea how that worked, how any of this worked. I didn't even know what the fittings were called. I spent like hours trying to look this up to figure out what this thing is. And I still don't actually know the name of it, but I know that this is an eight millimeter or five sixteenths uh, hose. And that right there is an eighth inch NPT thread. That was enough for me to get the parts that I need and get this guy working again. And I gotta tell you, I'm just pumped. Like, I've been killing myself working on this. I'm about to go take a break, get something to eat, and just appreciate the fact that there's one more thing checked off the list. We now know how to release the tool and lock it back in. Now I gotta tell Mach 4 to release the tool and re-engage it with the automatic tool changer. I have no idea how to do that just yet but one thing at a time. Now, eventually I'll have this fully automated once I figure out how to write the macro and then call up the macro to select the appropriate tool from the rack over there. But what I'll do for now is just jog the head over here, release the tool. That's just flipping on the air. And the tool change is done. So for now, that's really fast, and uh, eventually it'll be fully automated and it can change tools by itself. The next major component is gonna be the VFD, or variable frequency drive. This guy is gonna be controlling the speed of the spindle as well as turning it on and off. And this can be controlled from your digital software. In my case, I'm using Mach 4. Now, this particular one is rated for 15 horsepower, and that is me intentionally overrating it to give myself a little bit of a safety factor. The smart question to ask here is, Jeremy, should I buy a VFD used, especially if you want to get one that large? The answer is uh, maybe. These guys have a capacitor bank inside, which eventually fails. And so if it's been sitting on a shelf for a long time, those capacitors dry out and that dude is no good. I would never buy a used VFD that I can't test before I leave with it. You need to be able to plug it in and plug a motor into it and make sure it does what you think it can do. Or you have some type of return policy if it's dead on arrival. That will be my advice. Now, I need to be able to get 15 horsepower worth of three phase power into my VFD. And that's where you get all of this stuff over here. This guy down here is a 30 horsepower motor that I'm using specifically for creating three phase power with my rotary phase converter system here. Now, 
It's because my system is so large that I have such a large motor here, but you may not need a setup like that. In fact, you may be able to go from single phase to three phase inside of your VFD. So I've made a whole video where I talk about how to do that, both with the VFD as well as uh, building your own system. And I will put a link in the description which just takes you through all the steps for building your own three phase power from single phase. That's mainly a problem here in the United States. In some other countries, you guys have three phase power like right at the wall and it's no big deal. But here we have to generate it uh, within our homes. Next up, we have our plasma cutter. This guy is a ADS Everlast plasma cutter and I have no brand loyalty. I have never actually, I've never actually used a plasma cutter before I started building this project. So when I bought this dude, I had to read the instructions just like everybody else and sort of teach myself how to use a plasma cutter with a standard head. In fact, I'll show you that. So this is the torch head that came with the plasma cutter. And I could have made this so that I uh, have a grip on the head and move this dude around. I've even seen people like zip tie the trigger closed. And then when they turn the machine on and off, the trigger is already closed. My machine is so large though, this cable is not nearly long enough. So I ordered a special cable that they make specifically for CNC machines. Now, the ADS is one of the larger ones. You don't need to get one nearly as powerful as this. This dude will sever an inch and a half plate. And so it's way more powerful than I would ever need uh, for the material I'll be cutting on this table. But this is another example of a part that I overrated because I wanted to be sure that I could run a full program and have it stop and it still be good. There's a duty cycle on this thing, just like everything else, and that duty cycle improves with the amount of amperage the machine can handle. This dude can handle up to 80 amps, and most of the time I'm gonna be running it between 30 and 50, so I should be good running the machine at only about half of its rated capacity. One other thing that you need to keep in mind is you will need a fairly good size air compressor for this, as well as you need an air compressor for the automatic tool changer. As you've seen so far, this project has quite a few electrical panels, but this is probably the heart of the operation. So we're gonna dedicate uh, a separate video to this topic. The main thing I wanna point out in this panel is this uh, Hycon controller, which is sort of the interface between my Mach 4 software and all of the components that are trying to talk to Mach 4. So this guy is talking to my limit switches, is talking to my motors, this is the uh, main hardware doing all the communicating. I bought this particular one because it could control up to six axes and it also had enough inputs and outputs for all the things I wanted to hook up to this guy. Now that I'm a little bit more educated on the topic and I've seen what's available out there, I know for a fact you don't necessarily have to get this one. There's several other options available that will uh, get the job done. Here we have a stepper motor driving my plasma cutter head. The reason I chose a stepper motor here is because I don't need a lot of speed and I don't need a lot of power. This guy is really lightweight. So if you're moving slow and you don't need much power, a stepper motor is by far the most cost-effective option for this. And it's plenty accurate. Plenty, uh, sometimes in the comments, people will say things like, oh, well, you need to have an encoder attached to it or you should use a servo motor so that you don't lose any steps. But if you're not overpowering the motor, you won't lose any steps. So my recommendation is for applications like this, where the thing that you're moving is very lightweight and you're not moving it very fast, use a stepper motor, don't invest in a servo motor. But in situations like this, where you've got a long travel and you wanna have high speed and high accuracy, you would do something like this. This is a brushed DC motor with an encoder attached, and this encoder is talking to my servo driver over there. I wanted to make something else interesting for you today, and I thought I might do it on the spindle side, but in reality, it's just not nearly as exciting as working with the plasma cutter. So, we're gonna make some heart-shaped gears while I tell you about my sponsor, SolidWorks. I don't know how to explain to you how excited I am to have SolidWorks sponsor my project. I love using the program. I hope you'll give it a try and click on the link in the description. Once you click on that link, it'll take you to a place where you can start your demo. 
and experiment with all of the features of SOLIDWORKS. If you're new to SOLIDWORKS and haven't used the program, there's a whole bunch of tutorials down at the bottom of the page. So just scroll down and it has everything from the very basics of doing sketches to more advanced features in SOLIDWORKS. Click on that link and let's show SOLIDWORKS how much you guys love the fact that they're supporting this channel and give you a chance to experiment with some amazing software. Good there, buddy. Dude, seriously, if these gears mesh at all, I'm gonna flip my wig. about and I didn't even compensate for the kerf. Wow we are so close to awesomeness. <laughs> Woo. This is too good. Ah uh, yeah. Oh man, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. I've been checking out the comments from the last video and several of you have asked how much does it cost? And some of you have guessed way, way too high. So here's what I wanna do. Now that you've seen all the components and where they come from, I wanna give you guys a chance to guess how much the machine costs. And in the last episode of this series, I will reveal exactly how much I paid because I have a spreadsheet where I kept track of every fastener, every single component that I purchased for this machine. So I know down to the penny exactly what it cost. And I look forward to sharing that information with you. There's definitely a learning curve here. Right now I've got it set at 45 amps and I was doing about 35 inches a minute. And when I got to here, I thought I would try slowing it down a little bit. So I slowed it down from 35 to about 20 inches a minute and the cut got a lot better. So I think I'm gonna let it run the whole thing one more time, even though I know I'm gonna be retracing the same areas at 20 inches a minute and see if it cleans up these cuts or not. Cause it looks like it didn't quite go all the way through uh, right in this area here. So let's give it a shot. <laughs> 